Okay, I want to welcome everybody here. My name is Merrill Leffler, and I've um, been waiting for the cameras to warm up, and they're already on the sound, and we're all ready to go. So, um, you know, on behalf of the City of Tacoma Park and um, the Arts and Humanities Commission, I'm welcoming, welcoming you to, this is the 12th year, the this third Thursday series was started by Don Berger, who was the first uh, Poet Laureate of Tacoma Park, and Don started this, and it's been going on under different directions for um, since then. Um, Martin Fitzpatrick did it, you know, was hosting this for a long time, but there's also a committee that has selected the poets, and I'd like to just acknowledge them to begin with, and that's Mary Beth Hatem, Meredith Pond, who are both here, um, you know, Madonna LeBlanc, and Ann Becker, and Ann was the second Poet Laureate of Tacoma Park. Um, and then the reason all this is getting done is because of Sarah Danes, who's the head of uh, community uh, and economic development. And um, she's been doing all of this without an assistant, so even the programs and everything like that. Now, I, I want to say before we get started that it's always difficult um, as far as get, you know, getting a large audience because uh, there's so much going on in Washington. But for those of you who come, it really would be great if you could uh, get the word out, even if it's on your Facebook page. The one very nice thing, as you all know, is that we are filming these series and have been for all these years, but they are now going up on YouTube pretty soon, like within a couple of weeks afterwards. So uh, those of your friends who couldn't make it, uh, let them know. And you can do that on Facebook or however you do that. And, um, you know, it's really a very nice, it's more than just a record. I, I mean, I was listening to Ellen uh, the last day or two. You, there were a couple, you know, uh, reading a poem on, uh, or two poems actually, on YouTube. So it's really just, a, it's, it's great to have that. Um, so as you all know, uh, we're here tonight to have three poets, to listen to three poets, uh, Carol Jennings, Henry Crawford and Ellen Cole, and we'll read in that, you know, read in that order. Um, you know, uh, I also, before we get started, I want to just call your attention to this. This is series, this uh, third Thursday is part of a whole complex of things that go on on the arts in Tacoma Park. And there is a schedule for October in here, as you'll see, um, and I won't go through that. But I want to say something just very briefly about poetry. There's a lot of, there are a lot of things that go on in Tacoma Park with poetry. I have this poster up here because this is one of the, some close to 30 um, posters that we have around the city. It's part of, uh, it's an, we call it uh, an urban poetry walk. It's a spring for poetry in Tacoma Park. And it's supported by the Friends of the Tacoma Park Maryland Library and its students at Montgomery College in the designs, second year design students who are doing these posters. And they're all up on the web PDFs. I have over 200 posters in my house. I have to find someplace else to, to, you know, to put them. And then we also have a spring reading of a favorite poem evening um, and a poem in your pocket, which we'll be doing again in the spring. So there, there are a lot of things going on. And uh, uh, being the chauvinist that I am, I, I want to say it is a credit to the city of Tacoma Park because the city is supporting so much of this and, uh, and even the poet laureateship. Um, when the city first announced that they were doing this back you know, in 2003, four, I thought it was somewhat of a lark. But I, feel, I come to feel very differently because it's a register of how much support there is for the importance of the arts. Poetry, but not just poetry. Okay, with that, um, that's not boilerplate, by the way. Um, so, Carol Jennings uh, is our first reader, and Carol is, you, you, is read in the series before, uh, but you'll see in the program that she has recently, in this last year, published a book of poems, uh, The Dead Spirits at the Piano. Of those that I've read, and I've read uh, many of her poems, they take you uh, into a space that is a meditative space, at least the ones that I know. Sometimes uh, elegiac, um, my mother's piano, for example, office suicide, the dead composers, and so much. Uh, the, the, the book is uh, properly titled, I think, The Dead Spirits at the Piano. But you can hear poems, I think, of some of the composers that you know. And I think it, um, to have those poems and then to listen to some of these composers again, it's going to, I'm sorry, I'm not just saying that. It's a, it's a different um, lens into the music. Uh, 
but when I say the, the, um, the meditative space, uh, you are going to be reading your poems, but I just want to give you one instance. And this um, is a poem called In Rome with John Keats. And I'm just going to read the first and last stanzas. Um, I particularly like, the, you know, not just particularly like the Keats, but Keats is, you know, I publish books, um, a literary press called Dryad Press. And of course, Dryad comes from John Keats's Ode to a Nightingale, that thou, that thou like winged dryad of the trees and some melodious plot of beech and green. Um, so in the small room where you died, I stand at the end of a narrow bed, as perhaps you did on better days. Stare out the window at Bernini's boat, still sinking on the Piazza di Spagna. Now that's the first stanza. I hope you're gonna read this poem. <laughs> okay, so the ending is, though they burned all you touched in a bonfire below, you linger here listening for footsteps on the stairs, horses on the square, mandolin players on the Spanish steps, the poem and the blood rising in your throat. It's not only the lines, but it's the soundings in this poem. If you listen to that last stanza, those S's that just keep on rising at you. And they're really, um, they're very delicate poems. Um, so it's really a pleasure to welcome Carol to read here. Well, thank you, Meryl. Great introduction. Um, I was going to read uh, In Rome with John Keats second, but I think I'll read it first since you just heard a little bit of it. <coughs> Keats was my first love in poetry when I was in high school. Um, and then decades later, I, had a, I was in Rome and had an occasion to um, visit the house where he died, which is in a wonderful location on the Piazza di Spagna, overlooking the Spanish steps, and a Bernini marble boat sinking. It's a fountain, so it's always sinking. Uh, and I stood at the window of that room and thought about Keats and his poetry and thought, well, there's a poem here. In Rome with John Keats. In the small room where you died, I stand at the end of a narrow bed as perhaps you did on better days, stare out the window at Bernini's boat, still sinking on the Piazza di Spagna. And had you not been so weak, his marble boat, like the Elgin marbles, might have sparked another ode or sonnet on mortality, a new metaphor for the life slowly leaving you. In those last days, to which poem did you turn for comfort? I would guess the nightingale your darkling singing to you in full-throated summer ecstasy out of the embalming dark, in high requiem for a coming February death? Or could it be the urn with lovers on the brink, like you and Fanny, bliss always out of reach? Nothing is left of your time here but Severn's deathbed portrait, tendrils of hair damp on your forehead, lids shut, Candles throwing shadows on your face, still perfect at the end. Though they burned all you touched in a bonfire below, you linger here, listening for footsteps on the stairs, horses on the square, mandolin players on the Spanish steps, the poem in the blood rising in your throat. The first poem of the book uh, is, is titled Mano Sinistra. Um, and it reflects my, one of the themes of the book is classical music, my love for um, particularly 19th century classical music and piano music. Um, I, uh, about 10 years ago, I took up the piano again after having not played it since I was 18. Uh, my mother had died and I decided to bring her piano here and take lessons again. Um, and this poem comes out of that. Uh, Mano Sinistra, as you probably know, was the, the left hand, the sinister hand. But in piano music, the term is used to indicate the left crosses over the right, which it does a lot in this particular Schubert piece I'm writing about. 
Monosinistra. I have carried mother's tattered Schubert sonatas, impromptus, fantasias, back and forth to piano lessons. Bought before I was born, binding held by tape, its cover and pages leave paper crumbs on walkways, in cars, on pianos. For months, I have struggled with the B-flat major sonata, composed two months before his young death. Its broad reaches exceed mine, as I recall how mother's long fingers handled them with ease. Here, my teacher says, skip to the andante movement. It's astounding, and you can do it. He shows me how it is played, the left hand, mano sinistra, crossing over the right to touch the upper octave ever so lightly, a sound you can barely hear, but feel that you have heard it. As he plays, I hear mother 50 years ago at her piano, while in the next room I read, solved math problems, daydreamed my future. Mother giving voice to Schubert's sense of death, me absorbing both of them, but barely so, not knowing it. I rush home to her piano, now mine, so we can play Schubert, mourn him a little, the two of us, together. As I get older, I find that um, medical procedures often trigger poems. And <laughs> uh, this one came about because an ENT doctor put a camera in my throat, and I, I really hated that. <laughs> I called it the color of voice. Because my father lost his larynx to cancer, and my voice rasps when I need it most, the throat doctor slides his strobe-lit camera down the back of my tongue, tied in white gauze so as not to trip this high-tech probe into the origins of my words. Though I am drugged on the palindrome of Xanax, back of my mouth numbed by a viscous gargle and a spray that tastes of banana, entry is not easy for him. I dream of other substances I did not want to swallow, seawater and semen, the flesh of lamb, communion wafers, bitter tonic I was forced to drink as a child when my parents thought me too thin. Suddenly, I want to speak, words I never said when they were right. I don't love you, or I'm not sorry, or I can't stay with you. When I let go for a moment, the doctor has his picture, then another. Pleased, he steps back, displays his photos. The future flowers of my voice, my throat is open again, and silence returns. Um, this one is called Elegy for a Poet. It's, um, you know, kind of a uh, 21st century experience. You try to track somebody down and go to the internet and find they're no longer around. I was searching for this um, poet friend I'd known in New York years ago. And when I went on the internet, the first thing that came up was a gravestone, which was clearly hers. Elegy for a Poet. Before we lost touch, we shared metaphors, poolside talk of Paris, tales of ex-lovers, especially the one we had in common. <laughs> Years later, I looked for you at his funeral, surprised you were not there. I searched your name on the internet to find perhaps a poem, collection, essay on craft. What I found was a photo of a southern gravestone, the epitaph, her spirit is truly free. Like him, you died too soon, leaving only questions. Why you traded New York for Tennessee? Why there is no book of you? Why your spirit was not free enough in your body? Whether you died by choice? With no one to ask, I look to your early poems. Those lines like, her tongue is an animal caught in a trap. It writhes at the root of his silence. Neither of us could write elegies. So I rearrange your lines, steal a few similes, try to swallow your voice. Um, here's one, a newer one, not in the book. Um, if you ever took piano lessons as a child, you probably had occasion to play 
um, Beethoven's Fur Elise, uh, which I, I still play and I really like it. Um, but I kind of wondered about Elise and who she might be, so I tried to do some research and found nobody really knows who she was. And in fact, that may not have been her name at all. Um, Beethoven had terrible handwriting, so it, the publisher might have misread whatever he wrote. Uh, the score was found in the uh, papers of a woman named Therese when she died. Um, and he had loved her once and had asked her to marry him. And she wisely turned him down. He would have been a terrible husband. Uh, so I tried to take on the voice of Elise, whoever she might have been, talking to what she might have said to Beethoven. For Beethoven, from Elise. You ruined me for other men you know. I have been loved by others more handsome than you, with gentle touch and pretty words. But each time I begin to fall, your teasing eighth notes that presage the melody course through me to intervene. It was a trifle for you, your A minor bagatelle with its little arcs and bridges, always coming back to that winsome lyric, forever implanted in my body and brain, a theme that never fully resolves, like my feelings for you. Your publisher got my name wrong due to your terrible handwriting. Elise does not exist, though she will outlive me to taunt generations of piano students who will love or hate her for testing them, making fun of their imperfect playing, much as you did to me. I could never possess you or you me, yet because of that little piece, dashed off in an hour, no doubt, we will stay forever linked. What we both wanted, I believe. Uh, the, the latter section of the book is kind of seasonal, solstice to solstice, equinox to equinox, and gaining light, losing light. Um, this one is an October poem. It's, it came out of a very strange dream. A woman in thin October light. She bleeds her hidden colors, like the ash, willow, oak, into margins of a year gone bad with drought, flood, earthquakes, along unexpected faults. After equinox, bones thin, skin sheds, as sun withdraws from the hemisphere. The body becomes weightless as words. She no longer sees reflections in pool or mirror, just something diaphanous without form or substance. Rings are loose on her fingers, she no longer walks, but floats, undefined, without edge. She hovers, questions. Do I still exist? Is this the only one I can be? Leans into the dark of an Arctic night, tries to slip into a body more familiar, perhaps an earlier life. Um, this one was written after visiting Ireland and the, uh, the burren on the west coast of Ireland. It's a glacial landscape, very, very stark, but beautiful in its own way. The burren. More like a moon than earth, stark limestone landscape, glacier gouged and scraped. Portal tomb holds balance, as it has for 6,000 years, over bones of a people who did not know they were the early act of an Irish saga, or that cutting all the trees would erode the soil that sustained them down to the slippery rock where only tough wildflowers survive in the fissures, or how differing visions of God would blight this island forever. We tiptoe gingerly. Um, how am I doing on time? <laughs> okay, um, one more. This is um, called Bedtime for Insomniacs. It's sort of a list of instructions, although they don't really work. <laughs> Bedtime for Insomniacs. Bolt the door against demons, intruders, lost lovers. Lower the thermostat. Avoid overheated dreams. Turn the cat out to probe the underside of night. Put pens away. Lock the diary against entry. 
wash hands and face, purge the mind of reason and light, flip switches room by room on the day's detritus, recycled news of murder, war, court decrees, storms, half-formed arguments, unfinished messages, dishes not cleared, love undeclared. Don't untangle lies, add costs, or repent sins. Tell the spirits of the dead to leave through one window left open. Or if they must stay to settle down, stop fluttering, cease commenting on the messiness of life. Thank you. You know, there, there are many quotes that one can pull up about poetry. Um, for as many poets as there are, each one has probably two or three or four about what poetry is or um, maybe for that moment. But there's one that particularly st struck me that you know, stays with me, and that is a, a small um, quote by Ezra Pound, that all poetic language is the language of exploration. And I thought of that in terms of Henry's poems that I've just encountered really in the, you know, in the last few days. Um, in, in the ones that I've been able to get a hold of. And so I might make some generalizations which uh, his poems may not reflect, but we'll see. Um, but from, what, from what my reading, which I was really excited by, so, by the dimensions of the poems, you know, some are offbeat and experimental, you know, not necessarily in large ways. For instance, in notation, uh, Rather than commas of periods, there are, there are a couple of poems that use brackets. Well, I think I know how to read them, or I can read them on the page. How they read out loud would be interesting to see. Um, but And then there's a, a couple of poems uh, in the city of Washington. So there are two views, one Washington 1873 and Washington 1948. And in those, he doesn't use punctuation the, the normal way of commas or uh, periods, but there are the greater than signs, okay? I, I will say, I would love to see you take on Washington in, say, 1970, you know, to make part of this whole thing, and even today, <laughs> which would be a great challenge. Um, um, at any rate, but that's just one aspect. Um, then there are sm you know, four small stories. I, I, I hope you're going to read that. I think that that is wholly unique in its storytelling, as you'll see. It's, it's, um, it's a kind of, I don't know if puzzle is, because that would be uh, you know, pulling it down. But there is a, uh, an enigmatic um, puzzle quality to it. it and um, it, it seems to be very postmodern in a way. Um, and then there is a driving the car, which you'll see there's this repetitive chord that goes through. And I am driving, I am driving. It's, it's just a few lines. Stores going by, some already gone. Streets holding up, a mirror to my wheels, lapping up the surface of the earth. The night is all comets unconsciously coming at us. And he keeps going on. And then I am driving, I am driving. And so there's that kind of um, uh, passing on, passing by. And then in a wholly very different way, uh, a poem called Every Morning Maddie. I, I read it as a father's poem, a father's lament, a resigned acceptance in some ways. Uh, and then in the program that you have here, you have, um, you have Henry's poem, Distant, with its piling on of similes and analogies. And I, I, this is to say that I think we're in for a little of exploration here. So Henry, it's all yours. Thank you very much. That was a very kind uh, intro. And uh, the, the writing is, if, you don't, if you're not familiar, it, it's weirder than, uh, than was made out to be. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for, uh, for that great. And I'll be reading today from my uh, book, American Software, um, that came out in May, and a couple of new ones. Um, and I am a, a software programmer by uh, profession, and so that's how all those angled brackets and all that weird grammar appears, because uh, I started writing poetry at computer screens in the breaks of writing code. 
But I'm going to start today with one that's not in the book, so that you can get a little familiar with my voice. This is one uh, that is my homage to the city of Washington. And it is also a homage to the Joaquin Miller poem, Columbus, which maybe you knew back from uh, when you were a child. This is one that says, sail on, sail on, Columbus. And it's a sort of a, a, a mashup of those things. And there's going to be a whole lot of different references to uh, things in the District of Columbia, which you may or may not know. So um, keep attentive. We'll take this tour. This is, uh, oh, Columbia. Your Coliseum streets, your lofty, uber-clogged traffic circles, your gaggle of lunchtime lobbyists doubling down on M Street, haunches, consorting and reporting. Big Jim, the old man of the firm, holding forth, counseling his partners, sail on, sail on. In seas of flying fish at Metro Center, just up from the spawning grounds of Bethesda, while the president, still in his underwear at noon, looks over the roofs of tourist shops, the march of middle school penguins across Constitution and Independence, keeping their young punks' eyes on the shiny shoes of Cleveland Park interns, Banana Republic millennials catching lunchtime rays, sail on, sail on. In the many minutes of meetings, printing and reprinting, tweeting and retweeting, learning to read the lips of tireless smiles, of kitchen coups, of unseen knives, even the leather-faced beggars of Gallery Place, Look away in pity as white-skinned police cars sweep up the crumbs along the Francophile squares of pigeon-coated generals shouting from their leaden horses, sail on, sail on, up the crooked stairs of the Hotel Washington to watch Gandhi directing traffic on Mass Ave before going on breaks at, at the Phillips, to walk into the last remains of wood up oil-fragrant stairs varnished in a wiser time to lunch with Kayabat and Renoir and to whisper to yourself the only words a city ever knows, sail on, sail on. Be, being that I work in IT, I get to change jobs a lot every few years. That's the way it works in my profession. So I go through a lot of orientations. And so one time I was in one of these things and I imagined what would it be like if I went to a weird orientation? And that's what this is, the orientation. Oh, and it's written in this bracketed style. And if you, I hope you can pick up the rhythm in there, and I hope you pick up the book. You can see that, it, that, it, that it's written in a way that sort of moves along in this uh, sort of loping way. The orientation. Good morning. So glad to meet you. We'll show you around. Your cube will be over there, where Mr. Davidson had an office before he retired, and Sandy from HR took over, because Mr. Davidson was a lifer and had to go. He used to take the train up to New York on weekends to visit a guy named Sam, who was his lover. But you couldn't say that in those days. Sam was in advertising, so he could be more open. But his secretary, Betsy Williams, was one of eight girls from a religious family up in the Bronx with a father who worked as a printer with a union card. And he did not like gays and would not work with them since they were not like him or his buddy Bill who had a job reading meters for Con Ed and was led inside a lot of homes and fathered 20 children in his territory in the neighborhoods between Brooklyn and Queens. And one of them was an Irish kid they called Eddie the Red who would laugh hysterically whenever he smoked pot, which he did a lot since coming back from Vietnam where he lost his best friend Jimmy, whose mother, Joni, was the brightest student at Christ the King but didn't go to college because that was not an option for girls. So she took a job at the Playtex factory where she never filled the hole left by her dad who lost his left arm in a car crash coming back from the Second World War and settled in as a regular at the American Legion where he was known as Bob until he died sometime back in the 60s. So there, do you have any questions? <laughs> Make yourself at home. We'll stop by later. How are you doing? Uh, make sure everything is okay. Welcome aboard. It's a weird uh, orientation. Uh, this next one was mentioned. Uh, this is a, a, a serious poem that I wrote about um, in answer to the very serious opioid addiction problem that we now have in, in throughout this country. And I took a look at it from the standpoint of a father and daughter battling this disease, this family disease. And this is every morning, Maddie. Every morning, Maddie. We meet for coffee. Diner windows flush with dawn. She comes in from the street. We share a, a plate of bacon strips. My once vegetarian child, never this old. 
and I'm driving her to the methadone clinic these rain damp days, a maze of traffic cones and sideways signs. We go right at the railroad crossing. I don't ask where she's living anymore. Nowadays, it's NPR in the car, neither of us listening. I'd like to know her favorite song, as if she could hand me a burn CD, as if we could just waltz it all back. She has no phone. Almost 90 morning clean, she, her, her shiny black hair unwinding, all tight skin and darting eyes, her thin knees clutching the seat somewhere between urgency and nonchalance. I've come to know this place, people milling around the clinic. There's a Chinese takeout and a burned out donut shop and a storefront church, and then a space comes free, and I let her out. And sometimes that's all we can do with our children, is let them find their own freedom. So this is uh, another, uh, this, is, this is a poem I wanted to write about parental love, and I wanted to see if I could do that in a very primal um, context, that of a boy's first haircut. And I inserted it into this set because it really, I wanted to have it ring from our community. Uh, and I think you'll hear a little bit of that in there. Uh, this is Saturday morning. We were out for a haircut, and I had taken his hand, and we were walking through the alley between the coffee shop and the Salvador market with the smell of trash from a damp green dumpster, and it was his first haircut, and I gripped his small, unpre unpredictable hand, and there were a couple of dozen birds up on a wire, and the sidewalk was lined in long shadows, and we went into the barber shop together because it was his first haircut. And they had a special seat for him. And the scissors sounded in taut metal squeaks as the clippings fell silently to the floor. And his small tongue came out to bear the barber's work. And when it was done, they found a piece of licorice in a cup near a pile of fresh towels placed square on the barber's white shelf. And the floor was swept clean with a push broom. And we went out. And I took his hand again. And a shine had come to the windows of the stores, and the shadows on the street had pulled back a little, and we both looked up at the wire, and the birds had left. And we walked back into the alley, where the morning was disappearing into the shade between the stores. This one, this next one, Anybody watching the Vietnam series by Ken Burns? We've got a couple of those folks. Uh, I am so, from people of my uh, generation, I am so uh, uh, taken up by that that I thought, well, let me insert this poem. This is one from the book. This is a, see, I do a couple of these in the book, uh, monologues. And this is Lyndon Johnson. I don't think a man ever gets to know who he really is. I think we're all disinclined in that way. And though I would like to say that I saw everything and that it was all laid out before me, that I was presented with the facts, that my decisions were well informed, that I knew what I needed to know, that, and I think for the most part I did, but now, at the end of the day, I can't say for sure that I ever really knew. You know, I did not start that war. I did not go in there thinking, let's get these goddamn gooks. I did not wake up one morning dreaming of choppers spitting fire from the sky. I did not go out there and pull these young men off the streets. I did not lure them to this war like some Sunday morning glory dreamer. I did not, but I also know in another way that I did. Or maybe it was just that I was born into a state too long and too wide to be fully comprehended, and I was never able to shake off the cold coming down from the hills. I had big dreams in those Texas mornings, I mean, a man can see himself one way and also see himself completely different. I can love you or make you think I love you, and it really doesn't matter which is true. I saw my mom and dad, and they wore their love like a holy stone. I saw their ordinary mornings, her hat, his hand. I saw the dust all around him. I saw that dust, but as I think back on it now, I never saw it at all. I couldn't see. I think you could come down here and think anything was possible. I, I knew a man came down here with half a dollar in his pocket, made a fortune. I believed I could do anything, make things happen, get out in front. I thought I had a clear sense of what was true, that I had come from solid ground, but I got tripped up, and it was all quicksand. And I believed I was doing the right thing, 
but now I don't think I ever knew. And that is why I say a man never gets to know who he really is. More than that, I dare not say. And I'm not going to try to redeem myself, and I'm not going to harbor regret as would, as would a weaker man. And I'm not saying that everything I did was right, but sometimes I wonder if there's a way to know the score. And I would like to know the score, but you know, to some extent, I never will. Lyndon Johnson. Uh, I have two more poems. This one, as you, I wanted a lot of, in my writing, I use a lot of memes because I think that people understand memes. And so this is a meme of, uh, of the old uh, trailers that used to go to the movies, you know, and then you'd see the coming attractions. This is coming attraction, but it's also a meditation on the compromises we make in life. So this is coming attraction. And I get, I get to do voices in this one, which I always love when, I, when I'm doing these things. <laughs> now, at last, the story can be told, a story of deceit and self-delusion, a story right out of our daily lives, a story so shocking they said it could never be told until now, the man who played by the rules. Who was he? Where did he come from? What was the secret behind the man who played by the rules? You'll meet the child, but mommy, I just want to be like the rest of the boys. You'll see the temptation. What are you afraid of? It's just a little weed. You'll experience the lust, the desire, and the heartbreak of the girl he left behind. Sorry, baby, your art school lifestyle is not for me. You'll walk the streets, ride the bus, buy the car, own the home, go to sleep with the man who played by the rules. 20 years of education in the making, five years learning the ropes, 30 years on the job. They watched, they prayed, they saw him become the man who played by the rules, with Robert G. Grimsby as the boss. So you like getting these little paychecks, eh? <laughs> Peter Lamplighter as the priest. The ways of God are not for us to know. <laughs> and little Jimmy Giles is his son. Uh, tell me again, Dad, why did you give up your dreams? You'll laugh, you'll cry. You'll want to live next door to the man who played by the rules. In Cinerama, Technicolor, coming soon to a theater near you. And my last poem, the last one I'll do tonight, is, um, is one of my favorites. It's, it's a, it goes back to uh, 2014. And in the state of Texas, they were putting to death a man by the name of Jose Villegas. And he was, Jose uh, was going to be executed with lethal injection. And they were experimenting with different forms of lethal injection, different formulas, and they wanted to know whether they had gotten the formula right. And as they were executing him, um, they were curious about this, and he helped them out. And his last words, his, Jose's last words to his executioners were, it does kind of burn, goodbye. And so when I heard about this case, I said, I will make a poem of this, and Jose's words will live on. And every time I read this, I think he lives on in a way richer than his executioners. It does kind of burn goodbye. He was burning, and he was trying to tell us something. He was on fire, and he was trying to be objective. It burns, and he was trying to tell us that it was burning. And that's what it does. It burns. And he was trying to tell us, I'm on fire. And he was trying to lessen the burn, kind of. So he used the phrase, kind of. Yes, he was burning, but only kind of, like having kind of a dream being kind of awake, like being kind of happy, or feeling kind of blue, like being kind of on fire. And he was kind of saying goodbye. And he was trying to tell us something about saying goodbye. And he had just this one word. And it only takes one word to say goodbye. And he was trying to tell us goodbye. And he was burning. And he was kind of leaving. And he was trying to tell us something. And some of them heard him say, Goodbye. Thank you. Well, um, I won't go into a long thing, but it made me think when you said you, you, were, you began about being in IT and that having such an effect. Uh, I started publishing a magazine in 1967 with a friend, Neil Lehrman, and um, 
one of those issues of Dryad, as it was called, um, I was publishing when we were living in England. And in the graduate common room at the college I was at, I met an, uh, you know, an engineer, computer engineer. So this is back in about 1970, 71. And he also had an artistic sensibility. And he said he had developed a program for writing poems. <laughs> and he you know, had a vocabulary, had it all program. I said, God, that sounds terrific. Can I see some of them? I said, you know, I want to publish these, but I also need you to write an essay about what you've done. So in one of those issues of Dryad from, so we were before our time, you know, a little experimental. <laughs> um, at any rate, so uh, very different from Ellen, who, um, Ellen Cole, who's going to be reading, Ellen Arnofsky Cole now. Uh, I shouldn't say now, <laughs> going back to your maiden name. Um, yeah, Ellen, as you'll see in the program again, uh, has published a, a book called Prognosis and um, and they were poems that I read, and uh, you know, and I wrote something for the back of the book, which I want to read, but I want to say something about that. I went back to look what I had written, um, and what I had not remembered was that I had notes that I was taking after reading the book two or three times, and it was a whole sheet of you know notes and you know making lines about what I wanted to say about the book. And there were recurring, the, one of the recurring words in there was the word surprise. Um, is, and I don't know if you will talk about this, but it's in the program, you know, and I didn't uh, just look at the program. But the book Prognosis came out of, Ellen was dealing with um, you know, virulent bone cancer, very threatening. And the kind of uh, poems that you might imagine that would come out of that. Um, that needed to be written, but to be, you know, grim. I wouldn't say, and by the way, when I say grim, I don't mean a downer. I think any time you make a poem out of anything, whatever the situation is, you're giving life to something. So it's not the, it's not the theme. theme. Um, but the words that I was using were surprise, luminescent, uh, dark, laughter, not flinching from despair. So these, you see, and those were the notes that I had in, that I was making for myself. And this is what I wrote. The luminescent poems that make up prognosis cheer us by lines and images that strikingly register a range of emotions. Despair, fear, laughter, and even that old cliched word, hope. Ellen Cole has given voice to a distinctive poetry that confers dignity on the language and its capacity to surprise. And it's that word surprise. And I think that's what we, you know, we've all come together to listen to poets. In a sense, um, we're getting the outer uh, words of that inner, univer you know, inner universe, so to speak, that, you know, that, that inner poetic universe. And, um, you know, it's, I, and I think in many different ways, what we're after, or what I'm after anyway, is surprise, something that is going to jolt me. You know that uh, that is unexpected. It doesn't necessarily mean an astounding image. It may be the tone. I mean, I think the tone of your poems has a, a, um, a sense that brings you into a space that you that you listen. And um, so, surprise comes in many ways. It can come through, you know, uh, you know, some of the techniques that uh, I don't want to say techniques actually, because it's not a matter of techniques, but it's voice. And so we're listening, we're listening for a distinctive voice. And I think that's what Ellen will bring to us also. Watch this. Hello. <laughs> I don't know if any of you ever watched Pee Wee's Playhouse, but there was a character in it named Jombie, and he was uh, just a head sitting on a table. And a friend of mine, who is here actually, <laughs> told me that when I did reading, sometimes I looked like I was just ahead. So I, I thought I would try and combat that. Meryl, thank you so much for those wonderful words.
And this is prognosis. I have some copies if anyone is interested. A special reading sale of $10. Um, I've been writing a lot of poems that are in the area that I call neurotica. So I, I don't know if these, these are uh, not depressing or not, but anyway, the first one is called The Accounting. How I don't want to wake up mornings. How I am lost in my unwanting how I cracked my ribs, coughing. Lipstick cannot fix me. The fork ran away with the spoon, and the cock has flown the coop. How I cannot sleep. Embracing doesn't stir me. The little dog laughs to see me so. Time leeches away in tablespoons. How I have no resolutions. Bugs are in the sugar, and crud has stoppered the coffee pot. This next poem is a golden shovel. And a golden shovel is a form that was invented by a poet named Terence Hayes, where you take another poet's poem that you want to honor and you either take the title or a line or even the entire poem if it's short enough and you use those words in that poem as the last words in each line of your poem and this poem i used william carlos williams poem this is just to say it's the poem about the plums in the days of trump i crave strawberry ice cream after William Carlos Williams. I forgot how to swallow. I thought my tongue must have amnesia. It was as if I had never eaten before. I was 20. I turned the mess in my mouth, but the plums and pastry crust would not go down. That was why I twisted away, hoped you were not looking. I thought I'd lost my mind. In dreams, I devoured steak bread and butter, the choicest cherries, emptied the icebox. At meals, I tried to remember which came first, tongue or throat. When you turned to the TV and were glued to Walter Cronkite, I probably bolted from the table. Saving face was impossible. For weeks, it was the same, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I couldn't forgive my body. Why was it doing this to me? I didn't know. My other friends, they never noticed. Those weeks were the strangest I've endured. Then the delicious day that saved me. Something so simple. My throat relented, accepted sweet mocha pie. Now it clamps shut again, and I struggle to open, to breathe. So, ice cream. I cling to the pink to the cold. Driving from Silver Spring to Bethesda, I tumble into the time hole without warning. Thought follows thought in an endless train. The line stretches beyond both horizons, more serpent than train. It might be yesterday's menu or an error I made last night while teaching physical diagnosis at GW or how to explain to my daughters a person might be perfectly happy and still be deathly sad, or that time my friend Pooja invited me to dinner because I was blue and the food burned my throat, tears ran down my face, but still I smiled and said, I'm okay, really Pooja, I'm okay, and I can't let go. The clock stopped, I'm on the serpent's back. I've reached Wisconsin Avenue and don't recall a single red light or lane change only my own voice whispering in my head and the snake slithering beneath me. Blue. 
I'm 25 and driving home from my bad job to my newish husband, my head full of silt the way it always was, and I thought, this is my natural state, this melancholy. I told my therapist, a skinny young man named Anthony, I said, everything is wrong except my marriage. And Anthony said, no, that's wrong too. <laughs> that was pre-Prozac. 20 years later, I told my newest shrink, whose name was Kathy, I felt stuffed with rocks, then dropped in an elevator that fell straight to floor B3, the lowest basement parking level. Kathy, <coughs> excuse me, prescribed Zoloft, then Welbutrin, then Lexapro. And a little space opened in my head, as if some air had bubbled in, like 5 a.m. It's pitch outside. If you squint east, you'll see the faintest blue bleed into the black. It's not the sun, not even close, but still it's there, that color, that embryo, that darkest blue. One bird. One bird singing alone before light has even started leaking beneath the blinds and my stomach hurts like hell and I don't notice pain is creeping up my neck into my jaw. And they say in women that means a heart attack. They say almost anything could be a heart attack if you were a woman and think it's only heartburn. Maybe a twinge in your shoulder, then bam, you're sorry. You have to go lie down by the front door and wait for the ambulance. My heart keeps beating, I'm fine, I'm fine. But I know these body parts all lie, how they pretend to be okay when you're really about to die. And I remember there's a Xanax hidden in my second dresser drawer that my friend Brenda lent me. But what if I take it and I get so sleepy I forget to call 911? They say part of your heart can die even if you survive this time and that damn bird keeps singing although the sun hasn't yet begun to crack the sky and I could try to meditate. But I can't think of the mantra I learned in 1972 from the TM guru in Worcester, Mass. So I breathe with the bird. Breathe, cheep, cheep, cheep. One bird singing alone in the night. This poem starts in the Tacoma Park Library, which is in the front of this building. Um, I don't know if you remember, a number of years ago, maybe four years ago, there was a heat wave in this area, a really terrible heat wave in the summer, and at the same time we had a power failure. They were related, and um, it, it was pretty awful. So this, this poem is about that. Heat wave. Sitting between the stacks in the library with Jill, 105 degrees, and birds are dropping dead on the sidewalk, no power in all of Silver Spring, but the library somehow is immune from all that. There's air conditioning here, and Jill is cold, too cold, and puts on a dark gray sweater. At Westfield Mall, people sit everywhere on the floor, cell phones and computers plugged into power strips and outlets along the wall, drinking iced tea and giant sodas, staying cool. No one is interested in shopping, despite a big sign that reads, Heat Wave Sale, in the window at Penny's. Our house is unbearable. A mouse is dead of heat stroke in the kitchen. I'm draped over the bed like a panting dog. Brian suggests I take off my dress. I say, no, I don't want to. My words flop around like melted rubber balls. I take off my dress. I'm exactly the same temperature as I was before. <laughs> ice cream, ice dams, ice chests, ice pops, ice cones, ice cubes, iced coffee, ice skates, snow, snow cones, snowmen, sleet, penguins, polar bears, ice fishing, icebergs, I Ching. Good fortune. Ice over cool waters. The temperature will break and fall on the floor. The thermometer will heal and grow more temperate. Cool air will seep in from the north. A breeze will spring up. The sun will stop punishing us, although we have been bad and deserve punishment.
This is the poem that's in the program, When My Father Died. When my father died, we were right there. Goodbye, sweetheart, she said. Mother's voice, a girl's voice, so intimate I thought I shouldn't be listening and backed away. But in the hall, I shook and my shoulders heaved. She said, Ellen, we mustn't give way like this. She smelled of snowdrops. Her hair coiled into a perfect bun, held with a single pearl clip. Her shoulder pressed into mine, and her hand perched on my arm, then quivered like a winter bird. Um, some of these longer poems are, are prose poems. You can probably tell because they just seem to run on and on and on and on. What that means is that it, they don't have line breaks. They run to the end of the page. So they look like a block. This one is called, Good God, Girl, Stop with the Death Already. It's like I'm staring at a big gold watch swinging back and forth, murmuring, death, death. Every poem I write, boom, there it is, the skull creeping in, grinning beneath the words. At night, I whisper, please, darling, don't die tonight, into Brian's healthy sleeping ear. And when Nina in Chekhov's Seagull says she always wear, wears black because she's in mourning for her life, I whisper, yes, I'm going to heave all my black t-shirts, dresses, and pants out the window and dress in red because dead people don't wear rosy hues. Everyone who goes to theater school knows if there's a gun in act one, someone will be dead by act three, and there's always a gun. I tell my doctor I can't remember how I knew Nina was going to kill herself. Dr. Oser says, don't worry, people with Alzheimer's aren't unhappy, it's their loved ones who suffer. I promptly forget three more excruciatingly urgent things. They fall into a hole in my mind, and they're never coming out. You don't have to be a method actor to know what subtext is. The right side of my face starts twitching, and after a week I realize I not only have Alzheimer's, I also have ALS. I write two more sonnets about the Grim Reaper. At night, I cry, I cry quietly so I won't disturb my beloved. What do you like better, cremation or burial? I ask him in the morning. Dr. Oser is unimpressed. He studies my hands for fasciculations, tells me, no ALS today. How silly of me, I say, laughing a little too brightly. Cue to clouds at sunset, requiem in B minor played by an orchestra of cellos, somber children reciting Thanatopsis, Prince Hamlet and his flight of angels, a dead mouse smoldering in the pantry, beech trees dropping their diseased leaves. Um, I have just two more. I've been going through my poems lately because I'm trying to put together a full-length manuscript and um, not only is there a lot of death in it? There are also a lot of birds. I'm kind of a bird fanatic. I have a parrot, but I also i am very fond of birds. But there's a lot of birds in this manuscript. So anyway, this poem is called, My Poems Are Filled With Birds. I scoop the still living body of a sparrow into my hand. Its toes curl around my smallest finger. And is the Lord's eye on you, I ask it. Exhausted, it droops. Dreams of reaching beyond that airy space where kestrels skim the skies. The eye is benign, but passive. Does nothing to prolong the beating of this one's heart. I smooth the feathers at its neck. You are a symbol, I tell it. I will put you in a poem. You are a word. And the last poem I'm going to read is about um, my very dear friends, Judy, Neri, and Jill Raymond, who are here, and me, 
we had a, a little poetry writing group going for a number of years where we would get together once a week at a coffee shop and write poetry. And we were all going through a lot of personal traumas at the time, both emotional and physical. Um, but this, this group, which we called the Coffee Clatch Trio, was a tremendous comfort to all three of them, so all three of us. So this, this is a tribute to the Coffee Clatch Trio. Coffee Clatch. Judy, Jill, and I hover over coffee. We shake rain off our coats, take out notebooks, and write. This is our ritual. It is dark outside Starbucks. I drink a latte, Judy a frappuccino, Jill a half-calf red eye. We hover over coffee while the streetlight bleeds gray into October air. We fill notebook after notebook. This is our ritual. The sparrows won't come to the sidewalk table after sunset. We write, the bed is an altar, or the thinning of the veil, and sip coffee. Later, we lay down our pens and talk. Preen broken feathers, squawk indignation. This is our ritual. My daughter hasn't called in three weeks. Judy has an ulcer on her foot. Jill's medication is wrong. She shakes and cries. We hover over her, hold her hands. Mist dots our coats. We shake off wet, stir sugar into our drinks. Judy, Jill, and I hover over coffee, cherish the taste. This is our ritual. Thank you. All of a sudden, an hour has passed by, right? Um, so I think, you know, this is, you know, I want to say uh, that it's not a perfunctory statement, but it's really been a, an exhilarating evening. I mean, all these, these three voices, um, really strong voices. In the reading itself, that's not always the case in poetry readings. And so this has really been just wonderful for you know, Ellen and Henry and Carol. So maybe we have a round of applause for all three readers. I, um, I, again, I want to call your attention to um, We Are Tacoma, and that next month, October 19th, we'll have three poets, uh, Indran uh, Amir Nayagam, and Nancy Naomi Carlson, and Joanne Rocky Delapine. Plain, sorry. Um, and um, we'll be back here, so I hope you'll come. and um, or let folks know, get it out on your Facebook page, or share from, um, you know, the, the city, uh, Sarah puts out a Facebook announcement about uh, the poetry readings. We have small, modest reception in the lobby, uh, cookies and uh, soft drinks, <laughs> so I hope you'll all join us and, you know, the poets, and um, we can carry on from there. So again, thank you.